So far in 2.02 and 2.03, we've been talking about the nature of objects. They're simple, they're without properties, and they're substance. And we've been unpacking the notion of a substance and how it underlies both actuality and possibility, how it enables thought. More on how it enables thought in future videos. Now we're going to talk about how those, those aspects come together to form the world. So what is the world? If you've ever found yourself asking that question, then you better major in philosophy. This is Wittgenstein's answer. The totality of existing states of affairs is the world. Now, just like many of the propositions in Wittgenstein's book, it might appear to be trivial or very uninformative, but we'll see that it's actually making some pretty strong statements when we unpack it or when we combine it with some of the other propositions. Things get super interesting when we combine 2.04 with 2.05 and 2.06. The totality of existing states of affairs also determines which states of affairs do not exist. Now, this is super crucial for over overcoming some of the really implausible aspects of Russell's ontology. We'll talk about that in just a sec. 2.06, the existence and non-existence of states of affairs is reality. So world and reality are two separate things here. Because remember, the substance of reality traverses both the, the actual world and the possible worlds. The world is composed of existing state of affairs, but objects have the potential to recombine into other configurations, so there are other possible states of affairs that aren't actual. And what we're saying here is that the underlying potential for those objects to reconfigure determines not only the actual world but the possible one. So our world the way it really is determines reality as a whole. That's why by having access to this world we can think about non-existent things. If we knew everything about the way this world is then in the very same stroke we would know everything about all the possible worlds. So the world is all that is the case, the actual world. And what that means is that it's one among the possible worlds determined by the limits of logical possibility or the limits of logical space. The actual world combined with the possible worlds forms reality. By discovering what's true of the actual world, what we're doing is ruling out all of the other possibilities circumscribed by logical space locating our world within the set of all possible worlds. This simple idea that, that the substance of reality is the form or the possibility of structure then leads to the dissolution of this problem about the nature of thought. How can we think about what doesn't exist? Really, that problem is backwards. Thinking about this world entails thinking about what doesn't exist. If thought and being just lined up, and this is where Wittgenstein departs thoroughly from Parmenides, then thought and being would be the same. They'd be identical. There'd be nothing. To th there'd be no thought in the genuine sense. The very possibility of thought, that is, there being a logical space that our minds can traverse, is just equivalent to thinking about possible states of affairs. So. Thinking about the world just is thinking about possible worlds. Thinking about possible worlds just is thinking about the world. Arnon Russell and Brentano's problem of thinking about things that don't exist is a non-problem. When we think about possible worlds, we're not thinking about things or objects that don't exist. Remember, the objects subsist through all the possible worlds. There would give this structure its integrity, but rather we're, we're thinking about different possible combinations of objects. Even thinking about Santa Claus is thinking about combinations of objects that give rise to properties like works in a toy shop in the North Pole, has a white beard, and so on. So thinking about non-existent states of affairs is really no more problematic than looking at a stack of Legos and thinking about different ways you can put the Legos together. And if you do put all the Legos combined together into, say, form a, a castle, then you precisely ruled out that the Legos are forming a car. So the way the Legos are formed alone entails that it's not a car, that it's not a dinosaur, that it's not this and that and so on. We can think of Wittgenstein's ontology here in the early parts of the Tractatus as looking at Russell's ontology of what exists 
and taking a red marker to it and slashing through most of it so that all that exists is a, is a bare bones, simplified ontology that nevertheless underlies the very possibility of all thought. So there you have it folks, a tour through the first and part of the second propositions of the Tractatus. We could go on and on for a lifetime. Now we've talked about how this ontology underlies the possibility of thought, but there's much more to be said in that direction. We're going to talk a lot more about the nature of thought in the future videos, in the future parts of the Tractatus. Stick around, I'll see you all later.